we ended uh, the last lecture uh, with this uh, bijection here between cones and projective varieties. So um, uh, a cone in a n plus 1 corresponds to a projective variety in p n and vice versa. Um, and of course, uh, it's one of the advantages of, of thinking about projective varieties rather than cones is you get to work in uh, dimension one lower. So for example, you can draw nicer pictures or visualize it better. Uh, the projective varieties are also um, uh, compact spaces or the analog of compact spaces in algebraic geometry. So they are nice that way too. So we do uh, like these uh, projective varieties. All right, the next thing we might want to do uh, uh, with projective varieties is to have some version of the Nullstellen sots that we had for affine varieties. Before we do that, we have to make one small adjustment. Um, so here we go. Uh, the ideal, which we'll call I0, uh, that's generated by just all the variables, so x0 through uh, xn. This is called uh, the irrelevant ideal. Okay, why is it called that? Well, because um, the vanishing locus of this ideal uh, in projective space is, well, what is it? All the coordinates have to be zero, but that point is not a point of projective space, right? The, the point with all coordinates equal to zero, that doesn't count as a point. So this is actually empty. So this ideal here, it's a proper ideal, it's a, per, it's a perfectly reasonable ideal, but it does not correspond to something geometric. It corresponds to the empty set, which is the same as uh, the ideal of the whole ring or something like that. Um, of course, uh, the affine uh, version does have the point, has the, the zero point, the origin, right? So zero origin. All right, so this is this is the irrelevant ideal. And uh, with that, we're ready to state the projective Nullstellen sots. All right, so if x in Pn is a projective variety, then the variety associated to the ideal associated to x is just x again. So v and i kind of cancel each other out in that direction. This is exactly what we had in the affine case. Um, exactly the same. Uh, for part b, though, we have to make some modification. So if j is a homogeneous ideal, we need to also add this condition that uh, the radical of j is not equal to the irrelevant ideal. And in that case, then the ideal, the, the projective ideal corresponding to the variety associated to j will be the radical of j. Okay, that statement looks like the the, the same for the affine case, except for uh, this uh, this extra condition here. Of course, if the radical of j is equal to i of zero, i zero, the irrelevant ideal, then then vp of j will be the empty set as we saw before, and, and then the ideal associated to the empty set is the whole ring. All right, we can summarize this uh, with a bijection. We have a bijection. between projective varieties in Pn one-to-one uh, -one with uh, homogeneous uh, radical ideals uh, that are not equal to the irrelevant ideal. Okay, and of course the correspondence is x goes to the ideal of x and uh, an ideal goes to uh, the vanishing locus of that ideal. Okay, and the, the, this is of course the projective versions of those. Okay, good. I think the proof of this is uh, not doesn't give a lot of extra insight, and I think the result is pretty intuitive, especially compared to the result that we've already seen in the affine case. So if you're interested in the proof, you can look in the textbook, but I, I won't uh, do it for you right here. Um, 
The next thing you want to do is look at some properties of the uh, vanishing, projective vanishing locus and the projective ideal. Um, and they're, uh, once again, very analogous to the affine case. Okay, rather than write down all the properties, let me just flash them on the screen from the notes here. So the union of two uh, projective varieties uh, will begin be a projective variety, and you just uh, multiply the, the subsets together, uh, and uh, an arbitrary intersection of a projective varieties of projective varieties will again be a projective variety with this formula. Same as the formulas as we had before. Uh, we also have uh, this here, the VP of J1 union VP of J2 is VP of J1 times J2, which is also uh, the vanishing locus of the intersection. And uh, then we also have this uh, version of intersection here for, for the ideals instead of the sets. Okay, and then um, Part C is the only one you have to modify from the affine case. So the ideal of an intersection of two things is equal to the radical of the sum of the ideals, unless the latter is the irrelevant ideal. So that's that's the only extra case that you need to, to worry about. And that's just the case uh, when x1 and x2 are just joint. Okay, and then we have the ideal of the union is the intersection of the ideals. Okay, let's now define the homogeneous coordinate ring of a projective variety. So uh, if, if y is a projective variety, then um, we'll write uh, s of y um, to be the quotient of the polynomial ring in n plus 1 variables. Uh, by the ideal associated to y. So recall, um, for affine varieties, we wrote a of y. We're going to use s for the projective coordinate ring. So work on this homogeneous uh, coordinate ring. In the case of affine varieties, the coordinate ring uh, we saw later corresponded to uh, regular functions. Um, here, it's not the correspondence is not going to be uh, quite that easy. Uh, there will be some relevance, but we'll find that out later. It'll be uh, slightly more complicated. Okay. But one thing that we do know is that uh, it's a graded ring because a graded ring uh, modulo a homogeneous ideal is again a graded ring. We saw that earlier. Uh, so it makes sense to talk about homogeneous ideals in S of Y. So um, if J is a homogeneous ideal, and S of Y, then we can define uh, the vanishing locus in Y of J be all the points of uh, x in y Oops. such that uh, f of x equals 0 uh, for all f in j. And we'll call this a, a projective subvariety of y. Okay, and it's easy to see that the projective subvarieties of y are exactly the projective varieties that are contained in y. All right, so think about what that means. Okay, and um, you can imagine there's a relative version of the Nullstellen sots, and and also a, a relative version of all the properties that we looked at in the textbook just a minute ago. Okay, now we're ready. We're ready to define the Zariski topology. On, a, on projective varieties. So the closed subsets of the Zariski topology are the projective subvarieties. 
Once again, this is uh, completely analogous to what we did in the affine case. Okay, and once again, as in that case, you can e easily check that the Zariski topology on subvarieties is the same as the subspace topology. So it's uh, so it makes sense to talk about the Zariski topology on uh, projective subvariety. Okay, the one one thing that uh, we haven't really done before that would be good to check is uh, we want to check that this uh, Zer projective Zariski topology is, is compatible with the affine one. Um, so here's here's what we'd like to show. Uh, we'd like to check that if you take uh, a n included into p n. So remember we talked about how to do this in the last lecture. Uh, you take a point with coordinates x1 through xn and map it to uh, a point with uh, homogeneous coordinates 1, x1 through xn. Okay, and we saw before that this was a this was an injective map. Okay, and what we'd like to do is show that the topology here is compatible. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, if you take the projective Zariski topology on Pn and, and then uh, restrict it to An and take the subspace space topology, I'd like to know that that's the same as the Zariski topology on An. To do this, we're going to introduce a construction that's very useful when you're going back and forth between uh, this uh, PN and, and AN here. All right. So for F in the polynomial ring with n plus 1 variables uh, that's ho homogeneous, uh, we'll define uh, the dehomogenization. of f to be uh, f superscript i. The i stands for inhomogeneous because I, in general f i will not be homogeneous anymore. We'll, uh, we'll take f and we'll set x 0 equal to 1 and then consider it as a polynomial in the ring with only n variables. Okay, so we'll set x 0 equal to 1 and then uh, remove it from the ring. So this is a, just starts with x1 right here. Okay, uh, we should note that this is a ring homomorphism. So if you have a f times g and you uh, dehomogenize that, that's the same as just uh, dehomogenizing them separately and then mo multiplying and the same thing for sums. I think that's that's easy to check. And uh, it's also surjective, which uh, tells us that it works well for ideals. So if uh, J is an ideal, a uh, homogeneous ideal, uh, then we can take the J super I, so then the dehomogenization of J, and it will just be the, the set of all fi where f was an element of j and, and that will be an ideal in the ring with only n variables we should see uh, an example really quick so if we take uh, x0 to the third plus x0 squared x1 plus x2 to the third. That's a homogeneous polynomial. If we take its dehomogenization, we'll just get, uh, we'll just set x0 equal to 1. So we'll just get 1 plus x1 plus x2 to the third. Okay, so that's not too bad. All right, that's, uh, that's part A of the construction. Let's do part B, which is a, a, a sort of inverse operation. So uh, if now we have f in the polynomial ring with n variables, x1 through xn, then we want to be able to take its homogenization. Uh, let, let's assume that f is degree d. 
then the homogenization is F uh, superscript H and you can write down the definition like this you take x0 to the dth power where d is uh, the degree of f and multiply it by f x1 over x0 x2 over x0 uh, up to xn over x0 okay i mean one way you could kind of think about this is we're plugging here and here degree zero things into f so now uh, f is homogeneous because everything's degree zero. Okay, but then we want to, it to still be a polynomial, so you multiply by x zero to the d, and that clears that's, uh, that's big enough to clear all the denominators out. Uh, I think it's easier to just uh, see an example. So if we took one plus x one x two plus uh, x one to the third, and uh, we want to homogenize that, uh, all you do is you just look at each monomial and multiply by enough x zeros to get it up to whatever the highest degree is. So in this uh, in this polynomial, we have degree three. So we want to get each monomial up to de degree three by multiplying by x zeros. So uh, one has to get multiplied by x zero to the third. Uh, this one here, we just need one x zero. And the last one, we don't know, need any, so we just leave it like that. Okay, now we have a degree three homogeneous polynomial. All right, uh, let's make a note here. Uh, once again, it's true that uh, uh, hom homogenization respects products like this. That's not too hard to check. Uh, but sums, there's something uh, not quite right. Uh, if you take f, f plus g and try and homogenize that, uh, it's not equal to fh plus gh in general. Uh, what goes wrong? Well, if the degrees of f and g are different, then uh, f, h, and g, h will not even will not have the same degree. This won't even be homogeneous on the right hand side here. All right, so so that's not quite right. Um, so we have to be a little bit more careful defining the ideal because this is not uh, the image of a ring homomorphism. Uh, so we'll define uh, the homogene homogenization of an ideal to be the ideal generated by uh, the homogenization of elements from J. All right, so these parentheses mean the ideal generated by. Okay, clearly this is a, a homogeneous ideal because it's generated by homogeneous elements. Uh, let me uh, make a remark that you maybe you've already figured out yourself, but if you take uh, an F and you homogenize it, and then you take the dehomogenization of it, then you just get back the original f. Okay. What about the other way around? If I started with some g and I that was homogene homogeneous, and I uh, dehomogenized it, and then homogenized it again, would you get back g? Uh, well, not quite. Almost. Uh, when you uh, in dehomogenize it, you lose track of how many powers of x zero there are. So if g had some factor uh, of x0 multiplied by all the, all the monomials, then you'd uh, lose that information. So you, you get g back, but you, you might have uh, lost any factors of x0. Okay. All right. Let's return to the, the problem that we were wanted to work on here. Uh, we're looking at a n mapping to p n with this map x1 through x1 maps to the point with homogeneous coordinates 1 and then x1 through xn. A u0 we saw was the image, and u0 is exactly uh, the set of points in Pn uh, with homogeneous coordinates uh, such that x0 is not equal to 0. If x0 is not equal to 0, then you can divide all the points by x0 and you get a point of, of the form uh, 1 that starts with 1 as over here. Okay, good. Um, so, observation A. Uh, for any closed set, uh, X that's closed in, let's say, the, the subspace topology on uh, U0, so that would be a, a, something of the form like this. So any closed set is a VP of J, and now we'll intersect it with uh, this uh, AN, which uh, is uh, 
and if I check she was Q0. Uh, so let's say closed in subspace topology. Uh, we can also, we have that um, x is equal to uh, the affine vanishing of the dehomogenization of j. All right. So, uh, so it's also closed in the Zariski topology. On AN. Okay, uh, how do we get this uh, the second equality here? Well, uh, let me just make the following observation that should make it clear. So, if you have a F homogeneous polynomial and you plug in a, a point on PN, one of these points is an image of uh, the image of this map, but one of these points in E0, and it would look like this F of 1, X0, or X1, that's 1 there x2 up to xn. Uh, all we need to do is we need to claim that that is equal to zero uh, if and only if the dehomogenization of f uh, evaluated at uh, these same x1 through xn's is equal to zero. All right, so, so j consists of some homogeneous polynomials f and um, you can plug in points from u0 like this and we want to know that, that, that those functions vanish precisely when they're dehomogenizations, which are in this ideal, uh, which form this ideal Ji, uh, that they vanish at exactly the same time. Okay, but but this uh, this equivalence is, is obvious from the definitions, right? Because the dehomogenization uh, was just to uh, set the x0 equal to 1, which is exactly what's happened here, right? We've set the x equals 0, uh, or we set the x0 equal to 1. Okay. So uh, that gives us what we want. Okay, uh, now we just need to go the other way to make sure everything works. So if um, x is now any closed subset in uh, the Zariski topology, so let's write VA of uh, some ideal J in AN. Okay, so that's any closed set. Um, we have that we can also write uh, x is the projective vanishing locus of the homogenization of j uh, intersected with an. All right, so x is closed in um, in the subspace topology as well. All right, so putting these together, we've shown that the, the subspace topology on AN coming from the Zariski topology on PN is the same as the Zariski topology on, on AN. All right, or another way to say this is uh, this map, AN mapping to U0 uh, is a homeomorphism. In fact, later when we define the, the structure sheaves and, and, and have uh, our projective variety set up as ring spaces, we'll see, we can see that this is actually uh, an isomorphism of, uh, of varieties. Okay, um, let me make another remark. Uh, now that uh, we've defined the topology on projective varieties, uh, all our, our definitions about irreducibility and dimension uh, carry over immediately. Um, so let's see what we can say about uh, projective space. So first, let, let's see that, let's observe that by symmetry, if you take the set a uh, ui, so before we had a set u0, but now let's take a uh, ui, and that will be the set of all points with homogeneous coordinates, such that uh, the ith coordinate is not zero. Um, in the same way, that will be uh, an open subset of Pn uh, that is homeomorphic uh, to An. Okay, 
you have to modify your uh, homogenization and your dehomogenization uh, to use xi instead of x0, right? So in, in, instead of setting uh, x0 equal to 1, you set xi equal to 1. And instead of multiplying by x zeros to get your degree up, you multiply by x i's. Okay. okay. And then uh, these sets here. So if you take the union of all the ui's, uh, i equals uh, 1, well, I guess uh, 0 up to n, uh, that should cover all of pn, right? Because the only thing in the common complement is uh, the point whose coordinates are all zero, but that's not included in pn. That's not, uh, there's no point with homogeneous homogeneous coordinates, uh, all equals zero. Okay, uh, so this tells us that uh, pn is uh, irreducible of dimension n, just like a n. I believe we had a, a few exercises that we I probably did not assign, but they were earlier in the book that says if you have a, a topological space with an open cover, and if each um, piece of that open cover is irreducible, then so is uh, so is the space, and uh, I think maybe you need to make sure the, the intersections of the open of the sets in the open cover are not empty, but that's clear here. And then also uh, for the dimension, uh, it's, it's covered by uh, sets of dimension n, so it has to have dimension n as well. Okay, let me just mention here one property of projective space uh, that I believe is uh, covered in the exercises, so you can prove this uh, when you do the homework. Um, but it says uh, if x and y are, are subvarieties and um, the dimension of x plus the dimension of y is uh, greater than or equal to n, then the intersection is not empty. Not equal to the empty set. Now, uh, maybe an even better way to, to write this instead of uh, the dimension is this with the co-dimensions. So you can think about why this is equivalent to say the co-dimension of x plus the co-dimension of y uh, is less than or equal to um, to n, right? So um, the idea is that co-dimensions should add under intersection, and so if the co-dimension of uh, of x plus the co-dimension of y uh, that that should that should be uh, if things work out nicely that should be the, the dimension of the intersection of uh, x intersect y, and um, and if that's less than n, then we're saying the intersection is not empty. So that's what you expect if the co-dimensions are behaving nicely with intersections. And this uh, this theorem is saying that, um, this uh, exercise is saying that, in fact, it does work out uh, the way you'd hoped um, for projective space. And the thing I want to do is, is just to contrast this a little bit with the case of, of affine space, right? If I have affine space, I could potentially have two lines here. Let's just have uh, two parallel lines. Um, these are both a uh, co-dimension one, so their intersection should have co-dimension two, should be uh, something zero-dimensional, right? The intersection of two lines should be zero-dimensional. But in here, the intersection is actually empty. There's uh, there's no intersection. Uh, but now if we think about this in projective space, uh, these two points do intersect. They intersect in some point at infinity. Um, and that's because uh, they're parallel, right? So the, the point at infinity they correspond to is uh, the... Uh, as you go off to infinity, um, the points at infinity correspond to, 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 to directions that you can approach, and these are both approaching the same direction uh, at infinity.